Praise the Lord. All right, so I've got a teaching that they advertised last night entitled How to Find, How to Follow, and How to Fulfill God's Will. And I actually have six hours worth of teaching on how to find God's will. I covered it in one hour last night. Then I've got six hours worth of teaching on how to follow God's will. That's what I'm going to talk about now. And then I've got six hours worth of teaching on how to fulfill God's will. So I've got 18 hours worth of teaching in just that one series. And that doesn't even come close to covering everything that you need to know about vision. That series on Elijah is really, really good on that. And then I, that series on uh, the four keys to hearing God's voice is really good. You got to be able to hear God's voice. That's what Pastor Dwayne has been talking about <clears throat> this morning and, and this afternoon. What I want to do this afternoon, I'm going to talk about, uh, it's not enough just to know what God's will is for your life. That's absolutely essential, but that's only a first step. Then you've got to figure out how does he want you to accomplish it? And there's also a timing to the things of God. And most people don't understand this. One of the reasons that God doesn't show you everything all at once is because if he did, we would not be patient. We wouldn't follow him. We would try and do things premature and we would get out and mess the entire thing up. So he'll only reveal his will to you step by step as you're able to take it. You know, right now we have to have around $8 million a month just to pay our bills. And I need at least 5 million more than that. So right now we need over $10 million a month. If God would have put that on me 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I couldn't have handled it. But see, you just start taking steps, step by step by step. And I've taken all of these steps. Did you know this television ministry that we have that now reaches 5.2 billion people? I've been working on that since uh, 2000, January the 3rd, 2000. We started with 3% of the U.S. population and I just started taking steps and we've now built to where, you know, the billion dollars that we need to accomplish the instructions that God has given me, I've now got the foundation. I've, I've been doing things. I've been sowing into people's lives for 23 years and therefore it's all logical how it's all going to happen. There's some people that are believing for large numbers of people, but in a sense, it's like you're wanting to go to a bank and make a withdrawal, but you've never made a deposit. Did you know you reap what you sow? And if you are needing money, what have you sown towards this? Well, I'm sowing the gospel into people's lives. And the scripture says that if you preach the gospel, then it's appropriate for you to live with the gospel. But if I preached to five people, it would be totally wrong for me to believe five people to provide me with a billion dollars. Now, it could happen. I mean, one person could give you a billion dollars, but it's not my experience. That's not how it works. Uh, very few people. I have a guy that uh, one of my staff went over to him in Singapore and he had just bought his 53rd boat that day for, I think it was $53 million. And he was a tanker and stuff. And he's a multi-billionaire, picked this, uh, his Wendell Parr picked him up in a Bentley limousine that was following his other Bentley limousine with all of his security in it. And Wendell went there and this guy is a, a super billionaire and listens to me and has received a lot from me and he gave us a box of tea. <laughs> and it's a very nice box of tea. It's probably worth uh, uh, hundreds of dollars, I don't know, but you know what? It could happen that way, but it's never happened that way for me. It's the people that are just giving the $20, $50 or whatever and things like that. And I believe that God would rather have a billion people give a dollar than one person give a billion dollars because that way he could bless a billion people instead of just one. Anyway, my point is, see, I've been making deposits and for 23 years I've built things up and now that I've made deposits, I can make a withdrawal. But there's some people that are wanting God to supply their needs and have you ever blessed anybody? Have you ever sown into anybody's life? Have you ever done anything? You can't reap what you haven't sown. There's a lot of really practical things that go along with the stuff we're talking about. And uh, so anyway, my point is, even if you know what God's will is, 
He's not going to reveal it to you all at once. If you go from zero to a thousand miles an hour in one second, you die. That's a wreck. That's not acceleration. You have to start and just gain your momentum and build up to it. And there's a lot of people that you're just wanting God to show you a vision and all of a sudden, boom, from here, you go from here to there in nothing flat. God won't do that because he loves you. It would kill you if he put that kind of responsibility. If he gave you the opening, it's not enough just to know what God's will is. You've also got to recognize there's a timing that's involved with it. There is growth and maturity that's involved. And also you got to figure out how God wants to accomplish it. And I want to use Moses as an example here to illustrate this. Let's look over in Exodus chapter two. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this uh, most people have heard the story of Moses and how he was uh, supposed to be killed by Pharaoh, but instead he was put in a basket and he just supernaturally floated down the Nile River right to Pharaoh's daughter. She picked him up and raised him as her own son. So this is really neat how Pharaoh gave the order to kill all the male children and yet God worked it out so that Pharaoh raised the one who was going to destroy Pharaoh and had him pay for all of that. That's pretty awesome. And so it was miraculous. Uh, and then when he was full 40 years old, I'm going to turn to some other scriptures because if all you do is read in Exodus, you miss a lot of the information. Acts chapter seven and Hebrews chapter 11 are really where you get a lot of the information about Moses and people have only read this. Cecil B. DeMille's made the movie, The Ten Commandments, and he based it on this, and it also says in the credits that he went to Jewish rabbis, which of course did not read Acts and Hebrews. They didn't believe in that. And they came to totally wrong conclusions. And sad to say, most Christians probably are more influenced by the movie, The Ten Commandments, than you are by the Word of God. Most people believe that Moses, just like in the movie, The Ten Commandments, he was just a nice guy that went out and saw a Hebrew that was being oppressed by an Egyptian and killed him not knowing anything. That's not what the word of God says. He knew that he was a Jew. He supposed. Are y'all familiar with Exodus chapter two? Let me turn over here and read this to you out of Acts chapter seven. Let me read to you what the New Testament says. This is Stephen under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right before he got stoned to death, he saw the heavens open and saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he said these things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he was giving a history lesson on the Jewish people and it says in verse 22, Acts 7, 22, it says, and Moses was learned. Well, let me just back up and read the whole thing about Moses in verse 20. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses told God over in Exodus chapter four, God, I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. This says that he was mighty in words and in deed. That was just a con. It's just like many of us when God tells you to do something. Oh God, I can't do that. And then it says, and when he was a full, full 40 years old, this is the only place in scripture that shows you he was 40 years old when he went out and killed the Egyptian. And so it says when he was full, full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brother and the children of Israel. That shows you that this was something that God put in his heart. This didn't just happen. It wasn't happenstance. He knew that he was a Jew. Matter of fact, his own mother was hired by Pharaoh's daughter to nurse uh, Moses until uh, he quit nursing. And you know, back in those days, it wasn't unusual to nurse for two or three years. I've actually got a friend that was nursed until he was five years old. And I can guarantee you that she told him who he was. He knew that he was a Jew. And so it came into his heart to go visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them wrong, he uh, defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian for he supposed his brethren would, uh, would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So this shows you that he knew he was a Jew. He knew he was the one that God had anointed to bring deliverance to the Jews. 
So he knew God's will for his life. Some people think, well, if I know God's will for my life, then that solves everything. No, Moses knew God's will, but he was ignorant of the timing and of the way that God was going to do it. And so it's not enough just to know what God's will for your life is. You've got to recognize there's other things involved. So he supposed his brethren would have understood that God would use him to bring this deliverance. And, you know, I suspect that most of us probably would have made the same mistake that Moses made. Because think about this. He was destined to be killed is what the order of Pharaoh was. And yet he wasn't killed. And not only did he survive, but he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's home. I've actually read in commentaries, there are secular accounts that Moses was one of the greatest generals that Egypt ever had. And he went and conquered the Lubiums and he brought back in such spoil. There was never as much spoil ever brought into Egypt as what Moses did. And that is depicted in that movie, The Ten Commandments, if you've ever seen that, where they have all the peacocks and all the people come dancing in. And that is a historical fact. So Moses not only survived, but he was raised in Pharaoh's household. He became second or third in command. He was a great general. He was a military guy that defeated people. How could all of these things just happen to somebody who was supposed to die? It would have been easy to just say, no wonder God saved my life. He put me in this position so that I, by my power, by my might, by my position, I'm going to bring the deliverance to the Jews. He knew God's will for his life, but he didn't have a clue on how God was going to do it. God wasn't going to do it through military might. He was going to do it through these mighty plagues that came on every God that the Egyptians worshiped. It was going to bring those people to their knees. I guarantee you there's many, many, many Egyptians that turned to the Lord, I'm sure, as they saw all of these things happening. So he knew what God's will for his life was, but he just supposed God was going to use his talents his ability, his natural things. How else could a Jew have become second or third in command of the entire nation of Egypt? It all made perfect sense, but it was wrong. And likewise, there are some people probably right here that think, oh man, God, no wonder. I, I can see why you chose me. What a wise choice. Look at all of my great talents and abilities. Did you know you have to come to the end of yourself before you be find the beginning of God. God is not going to anoint your flesh. You need to learn how to walk in the spirit and you have to come to the end of yourself. And Moses was thinking that God was going to use him. And so he went out and actually justified killing a person thinking that he was bringing God's will. Did you know when you get into yourself and looking at yourself and thinking and leaning under your own understanding, it's amazing the things that you can justify and come up with. But this was never God's plan. So he missed the way God was going to do it. He just assumed God had put him in this position and given him all of this clout because that was how God was going to do it. He totally missed the way God was going to do it. And let me also show this to you over here in Genesis chapter 15. Pastor Dwayne was there just a few minutes ago sharing about Abraham coming out of his tent and looking up to the heavens. But let me show you this in Genesis chapter 15. This is where the Lord had told him, go out and see now the stars and number them. And if you can number them, so shall your seed be. And then he told him, uh, he, he cut this covenant with him and I hadn't got time to go through all of that, but he had Moses kill these animals, separate the pieces and the way they made a covenant, people would walk between it. Well, Moses killed the animals and he stayed until evening driving all of the fowls away, all of the birds that would have come and have eaten the sacrifices. And at uh, even time, there was a smoking lamp and a burning furnace that walked between the pieces. And there's a lot of symbolism here, but that's, that's God walking between these pieces. He cut a covenant with Abraham. This is quoted over in Genesis chapter three and many, many other places. It's mentioned in the New Testament, he said that this is where God counted his faith to him as righteousness. And Romans chapter four makes a big deal out of this, that this is when Abraham was justified in the sight of God, because God said, if you can count the stars, so shall your seed be. And he believed, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, verse six. And then he went on and prophesied 
that uh, down here in Genesis chapter 15 and in verse 15, he says, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down was when all of this burning uh, uh, lamp and smoking flax. I needed to back up into verse 13. He said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Man, I hadn't got time to verify this, but, and some of you will disagree and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. The children of Israel were only in Egypt a maximum of 120 years. They did not spend 400 years there. And you can prove that over in Genesis chapter four when it talks about uh, that it was, anyway, it was exactly to the day 430 years after this promise is when they came out of the land of Egypt. If I had time, I could prove that to you. But the reason I'm bringing this out is to say that when the Lord said that it was going to be 400 years from this covenant before I bring your children out of this land, did you know if you add all of this up, Moses missed the timing of the Lord? Because again, if you continue to read over here in Acts chapter 7, let me go back and just continue reading here. It says in, uh, in verse 26, and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. You know, again, for time's sake, if I could turn to Hebrews chapter 11, it says that he fled Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. If you just read it here or if you read it in Exodus, you would come up to the fact that he feared the king. But it says he fled, not fearing the wrath of the king because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't aware that Pharaoh wanted to kill him, but it was more of a strategic retreat. He knew that he had messed up, something had happened. He didn't fear just totally out of, he didn't flee totally out of fear. He fled because he knew that he had messed things up. And contrary to that movie, The Ten Commandments, he wasn't in the desert trying to forget God and get away from this. It says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And the word endure is not a passive word. It's an active word. And he was holding on to the word of God and believing that somehow God choosing him to be the one that would bring deliverance to the Jews was still going to happen. He was not avoiding God. And you can see that over in Hebrews chapter 11. I hadn't got time to read that. But it says in verse uh, 27, Acts 7, 27, he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away saying, who made thee a ruler or a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, again, this is the only place in scripture that shows you is 40 years again. So it's 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. He was 40, he was 80 years old when uh, the Lord appeared unto him in the burning bush that's listed in uh, Exodus chapter three. And so it says, when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight and he drew near to it. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him saying, I'm the God of thy fathers. And he had sent him there. The reason I'm reading all of this is to show you he was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. And then he spent 40 years in the wilderness and let me read one last scripture before I make a point here in Exodus chapter 12. And in verse 40, this is talking about when they finally had brought Egypt to their knees. Then it says in Exodus 12, 40, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that the host of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. Notice it wasn't just any day. It was exactly 430 years to the day after that covenant 
of Genesis chapter 15. And again, Galatians chapter four makes it clear that, uh, that all of that time wasn't spent in Egypt. There was a maximum of 120 years. They were strangers in the promised land and didn't have any inheritance except the burying place for Abraham had for uh, his wife, Sarah. So anyway, my point is 430 years to the day. And yet the prophecy was that they would be there for 400 years. So there's a discrepancy here. If you subtract the 40 years that Moses spent in the wilderness back to when he killed the Egyptian, you know what this means? He was 10 years early trying to bring deliverance to the Jews. Now that is really significant because God had given his word. It was going to be 400 years. He tried to do it in the 390th year. So he not only missed the way that God was going to do it, thinking that God was going to use him because of his position and clout that he had, and he was relying upon himself instead of relying upon God, but he also was 10 years premature. And we don't know for sure that he knew the prophecy of Genesis chapter 15, but I suspect that he did because the Jews were really strong on passing down their history and things like this. And it's very possible that if he knew that the prophecy was 400 years and it was only the 390th year, he could have justified it talking about, look how many Jews die every year with their prayers unanswered. Look how many people are being oppressed. See, this is the logic that a lot of people use today. We actually had a student that came here and he said that the Lord told him that he was going to lead 1 million people to the Lord. And so I was teaching on this very thing and he stood up in the midst of class and rebuked me. And he says, you're saying that there's a certain time and we got to do it now. And he gave the statistic on how many people are dying every single day and going to hell because they've never heard the gospel. And you're saying that we need to wait and prepare ourselves and let God be the one that opens up the doors and promotes things. And he got mad and he actually wound up quitting school and leaving school. And I've never heard from him since, but I can guarantee you if he had led a million people to the Lord, I'd have heard of it. <laughs> Preparation time is never wasted time. But see, there's a lot of people that they, they say, well, I know that the scripture says not to put a novice in a position of authority. And yet we do it all of the time. We take people who are sports figures people who are entertainers or whatever, and they get converted and we eat, uh, automatically put them on all of the talk shows and use them as an example of Christianity. And nobody is born again mature. You know, one person that I heard testify about this was B.J. Thomas. And many of you young people won't know who B.J. Thomas is, but he was a famous singer Back in, I guess, the 60s or 70s, he's the one that wrote and sang uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head and stuff like that. And anyway, he had a dramatic conversion to the Lord. And I mean, within a week or two, he was on the 700 Club. He hit all of the circuits and they began to start using him as an example. I think that a modern uh, comparison to this would be uh, Keon, Keon, Keon West or Kanye West. I've just heard about this. I don't even know what the guy looks like. But I, anyway, I've heard that he's supposed to be a born again Christian and things like that. And yet the guy has come up with so many weird stuff and things that make you wonder if he's even born again. But did you know that Joel Osteen had him speak at his church? People put him on television and begin to use him because he was famous. But the scripture specifically says, don't put a novice in a position of leadership. And people avoid that all of the time because after all, look how important this is. Look how many people could be reached through this. And I believe that Moses could, anyway, I didn't finish my story about B.J. Thomas, but B.J. Thomas became popular and did all of the circuit. And then he started saying some things that were wrong. And when he said these wrong things, the Christians turned on him and trashed him because he was saying things that weren't scriptural. And anyway, he wound up getting mad and fighting against the Christians and coming out. And it was 20 or 30 years later that I heard him say that he shouldn't ever have been made a spokesman for the Lord. He didn't know what he was talking about and he made mistakes and Christians turned on him and he just defended himself and it was, and he's, he repented. I don't even know if B.J. Thomas is still alive or not. 
But anyway, he repented of it and things like that. But it happened because they were just, they were looking at, look how many people we could reach right now because this person is popular. That's not the way that God does things. And Moses could have been thinking, God, I know it's still 10 years, but let, let's just suppose that there's 10,000 Jews dying per year under slavery. And if we wait another 10 years, then that's going to be 100,000 Jews that die without their uh, prayers being answered. And so he could have just thought, I don't care. I'm going to microwave this miracle. <laughs> Amen. And he tried to make it come to pass. See, this is what we tend to do. We are impatient. We want to make things come to pass, but there is a timing. You know, in my own life, the Lord touched my life, March the 23rd, 1968. He called me to minister and he gave me the uh, understanding that I'd be reaching people all over the world. I knew that back when I was 18 years old, but it was 32 years later when I started on television and it was uh, 31 years just before I started on television that the Lord woke me up at 3.05 in the morning and said, you're just now starting your ministry. 32 years later, and he says, when you start on television, you're just starting your ministry. Man, that was not encouraging in one sense to think that for 32 years I'd been ministering and yet it, was, it wasn't even my ministry. But then on the other hand, I'd already seen great things happen. We had seen great miracles and people's lives changed. And if all of that was just preparation, well, then that was encouraging to think it was going to get better. But 32 years preparing me, it doesn't have to take you 32 years. That's the reason we have Karis Bible College is to teach you all of our mistakes. And so that you don't have to be as dull as I was. But nonetheless, see, there was a timing. And I was frustrated during that time because I kept constantly trying to reach the whole world. I knew what my vision was, but there was a timing to it. And I don't believe that God's got a certain date circled on a calendar that, you know, uh, for me, it was January the 3rd, 2000. That's when my ministry started, when I started on television. No, he didn't have a date circled on a calendar. He was just waiting on me to grow and mature to a place that I could handle things. So there isn't a certain date like that, but there are certain things that have to be accomplished in your life before God will promote you and put you in a position because he loves you. He, when you get put in a position of leadership, I guarantee you Satan is going to unleash all of his weapons of hell against you. And if you aren't mature and if you can't handle it, it would destroy you. And God loves you more than that. God loves you more than he loves what you can accomplish for him. So he is not going to promote you. He's not going to open up all of the doors if you aren't able to handle it. And yet we constantly are trying to make what God wants us to do come to pass in our own timing. I tell you, you need to be, you need to be careful about trying to kick the doors open and force things to happen. And there's a balance between this because you can become passive too to where where. You're just waiting on God. No, God's waiting on you, but he's not waiting on you to kick the door down. He will open the door for you, but he's waiting on you to mature and grow to a place that you are usable. Like I shared last night, I was praying and saying, God, use me. God, use me. And he said, the reason I don't use you is because you aren't usable. Quit praying. God, use me and pray, God, make me usable. So you still have to be active. You have to be aggressive seeking the Lord, but not in your own might, you're aggressive seeking the Lord and just making yourself available. So anyway, Moses missed the timing of God by 10 years and it cost him 40 years in the wilderness. People often say, like for instance, in that movie, The Ten Commandments, you know, Moses starts out into the desert and the announcer, the narrator comes on in this awesome voice, which I haven't got. But he comes on and says, and so he heads into the desert where prophets and, you know, where snakes and scorpions are and prophets are. And it makes it sound like this was all God's doing to send him into the desert. God put him in the palace. If he had cooled his jets 10 years, he could have been in the palace and God would have used him. No, that wasn't God that sent him into the desert. That was Moses' self-will, the fact that he ran ahead of God that cost him 40 years in the desert and it cost the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage. 
God prophesied 400 years. They spent 430 years. So if you use the same logic that I was talking about, let's say that 10,000 people die per year in slavery and he was upset because that could have been 100,000 people in the next 10 years. Well, then how many died in 30 years? That would have been 300,000. Is that correct? My math's right. 300,000 Jews died that didn't need to die in slavery. If he would have been obedient to God, they'd have come out 30 years before. And who knows, maybe that generation would have been better than the generation that he brought out that disobeyed in the wilderness. Man, it, it messed things up big time. And brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, us leaning unto our own understanding, thinking, God, I can handle it from here. You've, you've given me a word. I'm going to make a paragraph out of it. I can handle it from here. That'll get you into trouble. And you not knowing the timing and you trying to force and to make things come to pass will ruin the entire plans of God. So it's vital that you have a word from God and that you know what God has called you to do. You need to have a vision, but then you not only need a vision, you need the patience to let God work in you and do the things that need to be done. And you need to not depend upon yourself. You need to get to where you are dependent upon God and nobody just comes into that immediately. It's a progression. You have to grow in it. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter four. And so again, if you were to take the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11, I don't have time to go there, but it says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And he was walking in faith. Moses wasn't running away from God 40 years in the wilderness. He was seeking God. I believe he was saying, God, I know what your calling is on my life. Give me another chance. I'll do it your way. I'll do anything. And so in the third chapter is where the Lord appeared unto him in a burning bush. Man, I hadn't got time to go into that. But did you know that in the desert, bushes burned all the time? That wasn't that unusual. But this bush was on fire and it wasn't consumed. And he made special mention. I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight. Did you know if he would have just said, man, Zipporah's got supper waiting for me at home. I, I got to go home. I, I've seen a bur bush burn before. He could have walked on by. Why didn't God just call to him and say, Moses, why did he do this bush? God, it, he delights in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And he's not going to, he could come and arrest every one of us. He could have an angel come and with a flaming sword, force you to do things. But that's not the way that God is. God will just reveal himself to you. Like when Jesus was walking on the water to his disciples, you know he was going out there to save them because they thought they were drowning. Matthew chapter 14. And yet Jesus just walked out on top of the very thing that was killing them. And it says that he made as though he would have passed by them. You know he was coming out to help them and yet he just kind of waved at them and <laughs> walking on by. And if they hadn't called out, he would have passed on by. Man, if it would have been us, we'd have come out there yelling, waving our arms, hold on guys, I'm coming. But you know, Jesus just presented himself. They had to call out. They had to make a demand on him. The Lord isn't going to force you to do anything. And so he just did something unusual that got Moses' attention. But if Moses hadn't have been seeking God, if he hadn't have been looking, he could have missed this encounter with the Lord. It was only after he turned aside. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse four, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. If he hadn't turned aside to see, God wouldn't have called unto him. He was looking for God. And when he saw something unusual, he thought, man, I wonder what this is. And he turned aside. And anyway, God told him five different times, you're going to go deliver the Jews. And Moses said, God, I can't do it. They won't believe me. It won't work. Contrast this with 40 years before where God just spoke to him, you are going to deliver the Jews. And he went out and in his own strength killed a man. He was self-willed. He was confident. Now here he is 40 years later saying, God, it won't work. They won't believe me. He had come to the end of himself. He had, been, he had spent 40 years in Bush University <laughs> learning that God... I've got to do it your way. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. You tell me and I'll do it your way. 
And so here's his final exam in chapter four in verse one. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. He just said they will believe you. And he said, no, they won't believe me nor hearken unto my voice for they will say the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Now, remember that Moses for 40 years had been looking to God and saying, God, give me another chance. And yet here he was in the presence of God, hearing an audible voice from God, a visible manifestation of God. And yet when he saw this snake, he was forsaking it all. He was getting out of there. This shows you that he was not a snake handler. He's not one of these guys that was able to handle snakes. He was leaving the presence of God. And then it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. Did you know when you take up a serpent by the tail, that means you aren't in control. That snake could turn and bite you. As far as Moses was concerned, he hadn't written the last part of this verse yet. He didn't know that it was going to turn back into a rod. From his perspective, to pick up a poisonous snake by the tail means that snake could turn, bite him. It was like a death sentence. And yet Moses was willing to say, God, I'm going to obey you if it costs me my life. I will obey you if it's the death of everything that I've ever believed for. You've got to come to that place to where you aren't leaning under your own understanding before you can be usable. And if you would be honest, there's very few Christians that would do something that would cost you. Boy, you can see that during the COVID thing. There are so many people that came up and told me, I know that God told me not to take the vaccination. I know God told me not to do all of this weird stuff. And I say, well, don't do it. And they said, but they'll fire me. You hadn't come to the end of yourself. If you're going to sit there and not obey God because it's going to cost you your job, it's going to cost you financially, it's going to cost somebody rejecting you. For you to really be used to God, you got to come to a place to where the only person you're out to please is God. It was John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, that says, duty is ours, results are God's. And yet there's so many people, if I do this, look, this could be the consequence. I, can, I don't even relate to that. If God tells me to do something to the best of my ability, I'm going to do it. I don't care if it kills me. And some of you think, well, that's easy for you to say. Well, I've done it. I quit school. I lost a student deferment. I got sent to Vietnam and they tried to kill me. I nearly died three times in one day in Vietnam. I put my life on the line and I'd do it again. I've done it before. I'd do it again. To the best of my ability, if I understand God, if he tells me to do something, I'll do it if it hair lips the devil. And until you get to a place that you will do that, you aren't fit to be used by God. So this was his final exam. God said, what do you have in your hand? A rod. It was just a stick. It was just a stick. There's nothing special about it. You may feel like you aren't anything special. You're just a person. But you know what? If you lay your life down before God and if you'll pick it up by the tail, which may look like, man, I'm going to lose everything. There's people that think if they yield themselves to God, he's going to send you to the backside of Africa to live in a hut and you're going to be battling mosquitoes and pygmies and things like this. And, and you just think that the will of God is always bad. That's not true. But anyway, you have to pick up your life by the tail. You know, I did that. I'm not going to sp spend time about it, but... I went through this exact same thing. God showed this to me 50 something years ago, what I'm sharing with you. And I had to pick up my life and say, God, I'll do whatever you want. And I still mean that. You know, if the Lord told me to turn this ministry over to somebody else and go do something else, I'd go do it. I'd go live in a grass hut in Africa if that's what God wants me to do and let somebody else take this over. I might not have Jamie with me. <laughs> But I'd do it. And I'm sincere about that. This isn't my ministry. I'm just trying to obey what God told me to do. But I'm not 
I'll do anything. This is what he was asking Moses to do. Pick it up by the tail. And when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a rod. And did you know if you would have sent that, if you'd have taken a shaving off of that rod and sent it to a lab to get a report, they would have said, well, that's just hickory or oak or, you know, whatever wood it was that he had. They wouldn't have seen anything supernatural. But if you go down to the 20th verse of this fourth chapter, after all of this encounter, it says in verse 20, And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. In verse 2, it was just a rod. But now it is the rod of God. If he had hit a rock with that rod before, it would have either broken the rod or it would have just jarred him. But now he could hit a rock with it and water would gush out and feed over 3 million Jews and all of their animals. He could hold it out over the Red Sea and part it. He could hold it out over the Nile and turn it into blood. Hold it over the land and lice comes up. Hold it up and frogs come out. Let uh, hail come out of a clear sky and fire run along on the ground. Let darkness come over the land for three days. No sunlight for three days. But in all of the houses of the Jews, they had sunlight, not artificial light. They had sunlight in their house when it was totally dark outside. That's what the rod of God could do. It was God's rod. And it's the same thing when you lay your life down before the Lord, he gives it back and other people will look at you and they'll still think that you're just the little brother or the sister or the person that's never been able to do anything. But between you and God, there's a covenant and you now have his authority and power and you can do things that are absolutely miraculous. And yet people will look at you. This is why your family rejects you because they remember you as a little brother or sister that had the runny nose. They wiped your bottom when you were a kid. They don't see you as a great man or woman of God. And this is why often our families are the ones that don't accept us because they see us differently. But man, when you give your life to the Lord, he gives it back to you and gives you supernatural authority and power and just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize some of this. But after they came out of the land of Egypt in the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, God told Moses to go camp in a certain place where they had the Red Sea on one side, two mountains on the other side. It was like a box canyon. There was no escape. And he specifically said, Pharaoh, I'm going to harden his heart. And he's going to say, you're entangled in the land and he will see this as an opportunity to come and fight against you and I will destroy him. And the Egyptians who you see today, you'll see him again no more forever. So he set a trap for Pharaoh. And so sure enough, here comes Pharaoh. And when all of the Egyptians start coming, the Israelites see it. They panic and say, this is what we told you. We should have died in Egypt. They said, let's anoint and." Uh, another leader to take us back and to make us slaves again. And Moses stood up and, and here's what he said in Exodus chapter 14 and in verse 13, Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So he knew that God had promised him victory and he made a great profession, said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But look at the next verse down here. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Man, I can think of great reasons why he was crying unto God. Here came the Egyptians with all of their armies and, and God said, why are you crying out unto me? He says, use the rod, take the rod. And you know what this is? I have invested my authority in you. I gave you power and I'm convinced, I don't have time to convince you, but I am convinced that if Moses had just kept crying out, oh God, do something, God, do something, they'd have been overcome. He had to take the rod, the authority that God gave him, and he had to tell the people instead of stand still, he said, move forward, move towards the sea. And then he had to hold the rod of God out over the sea. And when he did, the sea parted and they went through. And of course, the Egyptians were drowned in the sea. But God basically was telling, you know, 
This is things that we go through. Moses at one time was so self-willed, he was going to kill a man thinking that I can accomplish this. I can deliver the Jews on my own strength and power. He messed everything up, so he spent 40 years learning God. I can't do it. And finally, the Lord had to give him these signs. He also had him put his hand inside of his uh, vesture. And when he did, it came out leprous. And then he had him put it back in and it turned back to normal flesh. And he had to convince Moses because Moses had lost all of his self-confidence. And he had to give him confidence that you now have the rod of God. But then... Uh, he, he became very confident and did all of these things. But then when he saw the Egyptians coming again, here he is once again reverting to, oh God, do something. And God's saying, now you do something. I gave you my authority and power. So it looks like two opposites. Is it us? Do we take our authority? Do we make things happen or do we let God do it? It's both. It's not either or. If you ever get to where you are trying to make the things of God happen in your own strength and power, you will fail every single time. You'll mess it up and spend 40 years in the wilderness recovering from your own self-will. But if you get over here to where, oh God, you do something, you'll be killed by the Egyptians. There's a balance. And you've got to come to a place to where you have no confidence in the flesh. That's what P, uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter three, verse four. We have no confidence in the flesh. There's many people that take teaching about righteousness, who you are in Christ and all of these things, which I agree with 100%, but they don't understand that it's in your spirit that you've been made righteous. It's in your spirit that you're a born again person. And they think that somehow or another their flesh is good. Your flesh isn't good. It doesn't matter if you have USDA choice flesh. Your flesh is still flesh. And if you are in the flesh, you cannot please God is what it says in Romans chapter 8. You can't please God. God is not pleased with your flesh. He isn't anointing you because you are a special person. He is anointing you because of who you are in the spirit, because of who he is on the inside of you. It's like the apostle Paul said, it's not me living, it's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the son of God. And yet so many people, they find out that they're righteous. They're no longer under condemnation and guilt. And so now they go to saying, I'm special. Well, you're special in your spirit, in your born again spirit, but I guarantee you, your flesh isn't special. And if you think that it is, you are just a great person for Satan to come and destroy because you will trust in yourself and you will get smug. And then when you do make a mistake and you will make mistakes, then you will just crash. Like I thought I was better than this. You never get any, your flesh isn't getting better. The only thing that's getting better in your Christian life is you're getting more and more out of the flesh and into the spirit. But the moment you step into the flesh, your flesh is no better than it ever was. It's like flying in an airplane. You can say, man, look who I am. I'm flying at 40,000 feet, nearly 600 miles an hour. I'm awesome. You aren't awesome. It's that plane that's awesome. <laughs> And it's your position in that plane. You step out of that plane and see how long you fly. <laughs> it's the same thing. You don't ever get better. You don't get better. You get better at responding to the Lord, better at getting out of the way, better at letting God take control. But your flesh is still flesh. And if you ever get to where you are trusting in yourself and thinking that you're somebody awesome, that's the very thing that'll stop God from using you. You got to have your confidence in the Lord and who you are in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but I can't do all things. I am nothing without Christ is what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse five, but I'm never without Christ. But if somehow or another you could separate my flesh from my spirit, my, my flesh is nothing special. And it's easy for people to see that in me. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And when I say stuff like that, people, you couldn't, you shouldn't say things like that about yourself. That's because you like yourself too much. <laughs> I died to myself. I'm not, I'm not impressed with my flesh. Dwayne was talking about, you know, his looks, which you are a nice looking guy, but he said something about his looks, him and Sue. I've never been accused of being handsome. I've never had anybody come out and talk about things like, but it doesn't bother me because I am not living in my flesh. 
And therefore, because of that, when people criticize my flesh, it doesn't bother me. You know why some of you are so touchy? Because you love your flesh so much. Man, the Bible says, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. So when somebody comes and says, you're a, you're a zero, you're a nobody or something, I just agree with them. <laughs> Guilty on all counts, but praise God in Christ Jesus, I'm awesome. I can do all things through Christ. So I learn at Moses' expense that it's not enough just to know what God's will is. You got to know God's timing and you've got to know God's way of doing it. You've got to come to the end of yourself before you find the beginning of God. And you've also got to be patient and let God be the one who promotes you. There is a time to everything under heaven. So man, we are sharing some awesome things with you. What Pastor Dwayne shared today, these, these things would save you 40 years in the wilderness if you would understand it and operate in it. It'd be life changing. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let me have our prayer ministers come forward again. And if somehow or another God's touched you today, and if there's anything we can help you with, pray with you about, maybe some of you realize I went out and killed the Egyptian on my own. I have, I'm the one who drove me into the wilderness and you need to repent. Well, here's people that can pray with you and we'd love to help you any way we can. Amen. So do we have anything else before tonight's service? All right. So I think we're through. Let me just end in prayer. And if you need prayer with other people, come down here and let someone agree with you. So Father, we love you and thank you for these truths. Thank you, like it says in 1 Corinthians 10, that all of these things were written for our examples so that we could learn through them. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would take the things that Dwayne and I have talked about today that people would learn from it and that we could learn by their mistakes and not have to make the same mistakes. Father, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit teaching us and making this revelation to us. So we agree and we receive it and believe that this has got the power to save our souls. We agree and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you tonight at seven o'clock, right? Amen. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, come down here and let someone pray with you.